So it's great to be here. My name is William Colbright, and I work for this. I now work for this shadowy little organisation called the Digital Preservation Coalition, and it's wonderful to be here. It's about ten years since I used to attend archaeology conferences. I'm one of those characters who uh, quite like the idea of archaeology, but then discovered it involved mud and midges and rain, and got a nice warm, dry job in the site hut looking after the computers, and never really got out. Uh, I'll confess. So I find myself now working for the Digital Preservation. Coalition, but the questions being asked in today's session are really home to me. So, in a sense, it's lovely to be here, and it's lovely to be with you, and it's lovely to be home uh, with you uh, among the dead men. I don't know where that leaves me. My job in this short session is this 10 15 minutes is just to set the scene, explain who the people are that are coming and why they're speaking to you. And Pete's, in a sense, done this for us uh, already, but let me just very quickly give you various little important pieces of context for uh, the rest of the, the day's presentations, the rest of the afternoon's presentations. You, you have the uh, poor logic of me chaining myself uh, and me being on first, and anyone who remembers me from conferences 10 years ago will know that that never works, uh, so I'm trying to time myself. If, if it goes on beyond the first hour uh, uh, wave, okay? So that's me. Sec first piece of context, the Bedern Group, okay? So the Bedern Group is a group uh, of the members of the Digital Preservation Coalition. So it involves... Uh yeah, how did that not work? The Archaeology Data Service, Historic Environment Scotland, uh, Historic England, the Royal Commission in Wales. I was going to put the logos on the slide, but they change so quickly. Uh, you live in this century because the logo in front of your building is attached by Velcro. Uh, and so I didn't do that. But the Bedern Group is a group. Members of the group are here, and we meet from time to time, slightly, I wouldn't say in secret, but slightly kind of under the radar, to discuss matters that arise in the context of the preservation of archaeological and historic environment uh, information. Bedern, named after the location where we meet, which was the first meeting at the Bedern Hall uh, in York. And it convenes under, broadly, the auspices of the Digital Preservation Coalition. So it's one of the working parties, the occasional task forces that the Digital Preservation Coalition, of which more in a moment, uh, can facilitate. A show of hands of people in the room who have heard of that group other than in the session uh, today. So a smallish number. So it's worth me going a little bit into this. So realizing that each of us have, each of the members of the group have a piece of the puzzle. We all have, to some extent, digital data to be looking after. The participants representing those agencies got together and thought, what are the broad principles we're working with here? And there's a number of basic principles. There's a, a charter, a better declaration, which kind of outlines for ourselves. It's the kind of terms of reference, I suppose, for the group, which says, why do we get together and what matters to us? And we start from a very simple position, which says that there's more to the preservation of the historic environment than simply the historic environment, that it's an intellectual exercise in the broadest sense, and that the preservation of the record of that intellectual exercise is as, is as much part of our conservation and preservation role as as the, the preservation of the historic environment. And that works, and it's worked for us for de decades, for generations, with problems nonetheless, but it has worked in paper uh, terms for long enough. The problem arises with an uncertain digital legacy. The digital resources need different types of intervention to ensure their integrity and utility uh, over time. And that's a different set of actions, and they need to take place at a different point in the digital object life cycle. And arguably, we need to move even beyond the idea of document life cycles and start thinking about business process life cycles, and to an extent, even about infrastructure life cycles. And we can discuss that more later as we go. But this is the context in which the Bedroom Group therefore really finds its feet. This is the topic for us uh, to discuss. How do we do that? Well, we do that with a commitment. A commitment to recognising various things that we can achieve uh, as and when we get together to discuss uh, what we're aiming to do with these digital resources. And the, the archives that we curate, the materials we receive, the guidance that might come from these organisations comes in order that we can achieve some real world functions. So, 
important message. The bedroom group doesn't exist for the benefit of the bits and bytes. You know, we don't do digital preservation for the sake of the, the ones and zeros. It's for the real world impacts we can achieve. So it's for better management, better decision making, informed processes of archaeological landscapes or, or, or buildings over an extended period. It's about meaningful access. There is no access without some form of preservation, true in the digital sense as much as in the physical sense. And it's about underpinning credible, reproducible archaeological research, whether in the academic community uh, or for all the other purposes that academic or the archaeological uh, research uh, progresses reproducible uh, research and that's the commitment of the bedroom group to work towards uh, those goals and we meet periodically we haven't met actually this we should arrange a meeting for this year it's kind of once a year or so we get together we look at developing standards and digital preservation we look at work we can do together we make a, a little work plan for ourselves to try and identify important topics that we can share so is there a some way we could put together some guidance around collecting policies. Can we create transparency around cost models for digital preservation? Do we even know what those cost models might be? Can we create metadata standards that can be not only easily understood but easily implemented and in some senses even pushed upstream? Because if what we're trying to solve is an issue to do with digital life cycles, we need some of this to exist at the point of creation rather than at the point at which these objects arrive in the archive. Indeed, they need to exist before the point of creation, which takes me back to my point about sustainable business processes uh, and infrastructure. So that's the immediate context of the session. But there are other contexts to take on board here. There is a broader context to the work of digital data and the value of digital data in the historic environment. And there are three fundamental axes uh, of digital resources. There is the question of scale. The amount of digital material we are producing continues to expand. And it continues to expand. You know, the Digital Universe report tells us the amount of digital data in the universe increasing 44-fold between 2009 and 2020. A massive increase. And we have to ask ourselves whether we need all of that stuff. It's an open question. But there's a, a scale issue arising. Emily... Nemo at one DPC event recently uh, described the process of, of receiving the digital archive of a watching brief where nothing was found, nothing, 600 photos of nothing being found. So, so easy to create digital stuff. Scale of the archive is enormous. And that's a, a truism across the, the, the digital universe. Second scale of growth is complexity. Easiest example of this is to think, so Judith, you and I used to teach HTML back in the day, do you remember? And think of a simple HTML document. Yeah, an HTML, I was responsible for some really, really shoddy HTML4 back in the day. Think of how complex a website might look now in comparison to how it was in 99. So, the complexity of the digital objects which we present are more and more complicated. The file is not the atomic unit of preservation in any meaningful sense. And indeed, many of the metaphors which we've used over the last decade or more really don't work. So, if you look at what a Google Doc is, that's not a document at all. And if you look what a repository is, well, it's very different from what we might otherwise understand by a repository. So, growth of complexity. Finally, a growth of what you might term value uh, or importance, or perhaps you could turn it on its head and say the, the scale of the regulation and the consequences of falling foul of that regulation continue uh, to expand. People expect everything to be available to them all the time, and they expect it to be available at very low uh, cost. And they expect to be able to do things with that data which perhaps are unimaginable or have been unimaginable to us. So instead of thinking about the UK Web Archive as basically a series of web pages, of course the analytics, no one's going to sit and read the UK Web Archive. They're going to use analytical data mining tools to get into the detail of that and use it as a corpora rather than as a series of effectively print publications uh, in digital form. 
So the things that we can do, the opportunity, the value, the complexity, the expert expectation associated with digital resources continues to expand. Oh, wrong computer. Six pieces of context for you. That change is not a bug. Everyone, and if you've got a piece of paper in front of you and a pen, write on your notebook now, change is not a bug. Okay? We are not going to find a perfect digital paradigm in which these digital resources can be fi fixed and frozen in amber. Windows 95 was not the high point of computing. The point is we have to embrace the fact of the change. Embrace the fact that the technologies we use now are themselves subject to obsolescence. Embrace the fact that digital preservation solutions are themselves subject to obsolescence. That's a paradox. The tools we use to preserve the material have a shorter life cycle than the material uh, that we want to access. And there are any numbers any number of alternative methods one could point to in the context of change and the context of expectation. I'm not going to do the crystal ball uh, 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 kind of uh, act here. We're trying to predict digital futures, but just watch one or two trends. My favourite trend just now is vanishing IT. Digital resources or digital devices have gone from being things which were delivered on the back of a truck to being things which were delivered on the back of a van, to being large chunky boxes that sat on your desk top with big monitors, to being relatively lightweight, flexible laptop style devices that could sit on your desktop. And they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the software is vanishing off site. So instead of having my things uh, actually loaded on your laptop, you're now using services from the cloud. They're slowly vanishing from in front of you. And all of that means we're depending more and more on everything as a service. So we put ourselves more and more at the whim or a series of interdependencies which we may or may not understand. And if we don't understand them, how can we risk assess the future uh, access to our digital collections? So that's the context for today's presentations. That's the context where I work mostly now. And uh, I work mentioned briefly the Digital Preservation Coalition, the little agency with which I work. And all of the trends which I'm identifying for you about the kind of context of the historic environment data is true, uh, not just from the experience of the Bedner Group, but is you know, added to or is, uh, uh, in a sense, codified by the range of, of DPC members. So it's coming from all sectors, from all sorts of communities and from some very unexpected places. We hear uh, the same uh, messages. So, therefore this. So the URL for the Bedern Declaration, the Bedern Charter, which explains a little more about what we do. Uh, but also, therefore, you know, this. Therefore, this meeting, this gathering today to explore these themes more fully. And let me conclude this little introduction by saying, that, you know, for me, the Bedern Group is a nice example of friends and allies professionally getting together and sharing their concerns, sharing their expertise, finding ways to work together to achieve a greater goal, informing each other and doing almost the kind of the peer development and peer review uh, of each other's work. And that's a great model. And to extend from there the offer of the DPC as a friend and ally to anyone interested uh, in this topic. So, I'm very good at timing these things. <laughs> <laughs>